Welcome. Welcome back to CS 110. How's the Summit 1 going? You guys started it? I know a bunch of people started it. I've seen you in office hours. There will be more office hours. Uh, if not today and tomorrow, definitely on Sunday. Um, and then next week as well, we will have a full list available. Um, so I hope it's going all right. Uh, and I uh, hope it's not bringing back too many memories of like pointer math and things that were kind of tricky to learn. But you're getting back up to speed. And then uh, you're learning a little more C++, et cetera. Uh, let's see. Sunday at noon, lab sign-up will open up. There are most of the labs, sections, whatever you want to call them, are on Fridays right now. Like next week, many of you will be in your section instead of here. Um, the, there are a few sections on Thursdays. So if you do need a Thursday section, um, sign up. Try to get on there and sign up as early as possible if you're like, oh, I, don't, I can't do uh, Friday. Although most of you should be able to do Friday um, for what it's worth. But the, uh, if you can't do that, then get on there and do that. If for some reason you can't find a time that fits your schedule, uh, let me know and we'll try to figure something out. You do have to go to some section, but we will figure it out. So that's going to open up on uh, Sunday at noon, and there's a link on the class website that will be that will go straight to the sign-up page. I think that's about it for announcements. I think that's about it. All right. Let's get going. So today, we're actually not going to see any code today. Um, so what we're going to do, though, is we are going to learn about the Unix version 6 file system. Now, why do I say it like that? We're not just learning about file systems in general. We're going to learn about a very specific one to show you an idea of how a file system is built. It's not necessarily the way you would build one today or the way people have built them for uh, the last 20 years or so. Um, I think the version 6 file system came out in 1978 or something like that um, when computers were actually somewhat different. But they, it still works, and you can still run an emulator and actually use that kind of file system. Um, but it's generally, think of this as a case study in how to build a file system. Okay, so again, don't think this is the only way to do it. Don't even think this is the best way to do it necessarily, but it is a way to do it, and it's a pretty good one. And there were some very clever people who came up with it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And in fact, uh, the file, the version 6 file system is exactly the file system that you need to program assignment 2 for. And I'm going to go over three examples at the end of class today, which should help you think through how you're going to uh, code that up. So um, stick around to the end, and uh, we'll see those examples. All right. OK. So if you've done CS 107 or even 106B, you know that memory, at least RAM, in your computer is we can think of it as one big long array, right? Going from address zero to address whatever the maximum address uh, or the maximum number of bytes of memory in your computer. One long array, you, can, you could access it with either pointer math or just an array, and if the operating system allowed you to do that. In fact, if you took CS107E, you'll realize that, oh, I, if I have a bare metal hardware sort of system, I can access all sorts of memory, uh, which also means that you can dereference null pointers, and nothing actually happens until later in your program when something crashes wildly. But, um, but anyway, there, think of it as one big, long, byte addressable array. That's the RAM system. And when I say byte addressable, what does that mean? It means that you can adjust one byte of memory at a time. You can't do one bit at a time, right? Now, you can do masking and you can do bit masking and so forth, but you're always working on at least one byte at a time, meaning that if you want to read something from memory, you're going to read eight bits out of it. And if you write, or write something in memory, you're going to write eight bits to it, okay? That's how RAM works. Now, the disk drive on your computer, and in fact, many of you guys don't even have disk drives in your computer. You have an SSD, which is a, uh, a solid state drive, which I guess is a, it's, it's not a disk drive, but it is a memory system that allows you to store information that persists when you turn your laptop off or it crashes or whatever. That's what uh, disks are all about. They are generally relatively slow. Uh, although SSDs are much faster because flash memory is pretty fast. It used to be that disks, in fact, some of you prob possibly still have these kind of disks on your computer, used to be a cylinder that was 
actually spinning around and it has little reed heads that read one byte or well, they read more than one byte at a time, depending on the, the type of thing. They read what we call a block at a time. And they would forward that to the operating system, and you, the operating system can say, save data as well. Okay, so, the, so a disk has these things called uh, blocks on them, okay, or sectors. You can kind of use those interchangeably. I'll talk about the difference in a minute. Um, but we can assume that there's some fixed amount of bytes per sector. A lot of times it's 512. On some disks it's as much as 4096 maybe. Uh, but it's a relatively small amount. But that is the smallest chunk of data you can read or write from a drive. Okay? If you want to read one byte from a drive, you can't. You have to read all 512. And if you want to write one byte, you can't. You have to write all 512. Now, if you write one byte, that it's not like you have to keep track of the other 512 the operating system does, or the hard drive itself does, or what have you. But that's the way uh, it works, okay? Um, the size of the sector just happens to do with the disk itself, or the, um, like the type of disk it is, and, and so forth, okay? So, and you, it's a trade-off. How big your sector is, it's just a trade-off on how fast it is, and, and a couple of other different things. But this is what it might look like, and this should look very similar to the memory system, right? You've got Sector 0, Sector 1, Sector 2, etc. Sector 0 would be bytes 0 through 511, and that's probably a little small to read. But anyway, uh, that's the, like this is 512 bytes and then 512 bytes, and you just access it that way. Okay, so that's how the hard drive or the solid straight state drive uh, would work. The API that the hard drive makes available to the operating system is actually very simple. It's read and write, basically. You can read a sector and you can write a sector. And that's about it. You give a sector number and you read it. You give a sector number and you write it. It's a little more nuanced than that. But for the most part, you can think of it that way. And again, you have to write a whole sector or read a whole sector at once. Okay? That's the part that below that level you don't need to worry about. Okay? We're going to talk about um, kind of a much higher level of basically how do you take this thing here, this memory kind of model and map files to it and map uh, information to it that persists, et cetera. Okay? All right. Like I said, uh, and I've already done this once or twice, uh, you may hear me say block and sector kind of interchangeably. It turns out that the sectors are defined on the disk themselves, sector 0, sector 1, etc. You can have another abstraction where it might be that multiple sec sectors are considered a block. So you might have two sectors per block. For our purposes, and to make things a little simpler, except in the case where we sometimes need to think of sector versus block, you don't, you don't really normally need to do that. Um, we are going to just consider them being the same. So if I say block, think sector. Think the chunk of memory on the drive that you can read uh, and then you can write to. That's, uh, that's what we're going to continue going forth with, uh, with this lecture on. Okay? All right. So there is uh, a diagram here. Again, it might be a little hard to see from all the way in the back, so pull it up on your slides if you can't see it from all the way in the back. Um, but there's a, there's a diagram here that we're going to talk about. Now, as I said, this is one way to do a file system. It happens to be the way some people decided to do it for Linux or Unix version 6 back in the late 70s. And what it does is it basically allows uh, the files to be written on here so that you can quickly find them, depending on your definition of quick, and that you can read the data from the uh, drive in a way that is um, more or less efficient, okay? And we'll see what we, what we mean about that uh, as we go along, okay? The first block, the first sector or block here is special, okay? It's block zero. It's called the boot block. And we are not going to worry about that for the class, uh, but the boot block is basically what happens when you turn your computer on. Well, the first thing it needs to do is it needs to start the computer up and it can do that in a kind of a couple different ways. The first thing a computer does is it actually reads from its own BIOS, which is ROM memory inside the computer itself. And if you don't have a hard drive attached to your computer at all, it will usually read something from that BIOS, look for a hard drive, and then not find it, and say something like, can't find a hard drive. 
or can't find any, any boot drive or something like that. That's what block <laughs> sector one is going to be on your uh, system. And that's almost universal. Like hard drives kind of do that and they, they know to, uh, to do that. The second block is called the super block. And the super block contains information about the file system uh, itself as far as interacting with the operating system. Okay, and again, these are things that are generally like put there by either when you format your drive or put there when the drive is created uh, to begin with. We will not need to worry about those two uh, sectors at all. Okay, the follow on sectors are where things start to get interesting. Okay, the rest of the disk is made up of two different parts there is a metadata part, and then there is uh, and then there is a like actual data part of the drive. Okay, this diagram it makes it look like the, if you broke this up, it's like there's a whole bunch of metadata here. This whole part it's not really that much. It's in fact less than 10%. But we needed to make this at least big enough so that you could so that you could see it uh, to the extent that you do. Now, with metadata and data sharing this one long abstract kind of array sort of thing. You might be starting to sweat a little because it sounds a little bit like a heap allocator, <laughs> right? And you might be going, oh no, now I've got, I've got to deal with this like metadata sharing the same space with the data. And every time I put use some metadata, I, I take away from the actual disk space for the data itself and so forth. And that's true, although I think this is set up a little less like integrated so that um, we don't have to worry about it too, too much. Okay, the, the details of how the file system work itself are going to be enough to, uh, to keep you busy. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about it being um, too much like the, the heap allocator. But that's basically the same idea. You've got all this memory. You need to store both the data itself that you're trying to store and metadata about the stuff you're going to store so you can find it, so you can access it, so you can get information about it, whether it's a root directory or a file or how big it is and so forth. Okay, what the, what the permissions are and all that that's set in the operating system, in the uh, thing itself. Okay, so that's the, the basic idea of a file system, of this file system. Okay, you've got a couple blocks that we don't worry about. We've got a whole bunch of metadata in here, and then we've got all the rest of it being data, and this is 90% of the drive. Okay, and depending on the file system, that percentage can go up or down. I don't know if you can ever, if you ever really run out of that metadata space, how the file system actually deals with it. It might just say, look, you're out of space. Um, or it might be able to take more data out of uh, the rest of the hard drive. I'm not 100% sure how that works. And it's really not that pertinent. OK? All right. So we have uh, file payloads. That's the actual data, much like the payload that you dealt with in 107 if you did a heap allocator assignment. Um, and they're stored in 512 byte chunks. Well, that sounds like a good, that sounds like a block size or a sector size, and in fact it is. Okay, so they, the file payloads are stored 512 bytes at a time. Unlike the heap allocator, when you assign a, uh, a file, like when you have a file, it can use multiple blocks in different places on the drive. It does not have to be contiguous, okay? Which is good because it might it means that you can set up your file and then add to it, and then you don't have to go moving all this data around, okay? There's no realloc necessary. Although I should say that your hard drive and your drive can what we call fragment, which means you've got all these different pieces all over the place, and it uh, is not quite as efficient to to grab that data. Uh, depending on the buffering on your drive and, and so forth. But again, that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about now. For now, all we need to know is 512 byte chunks for your file. Okay? If you have a file that is one byte long, that file takes up 512 bytes on the drive. Too bad. Okay? That's the way it goes, plus the metadata. All right? Why is that the case? Because 512 is the smallest amount that we can deal with. And so therefore, we set it up so that our file has at least 512 bytes taken off the drive. Okay, This is why tiny little files can actually end up using a lot more space than you might think, because the underlying space has got to be done in 512 byte chunks. Now, that's for this operating system. And that's for this file system. It may be that more advanced 
file systems have another way of dealing with this so that you don't have that limitation. I'm not exactly sure about the, the newest ones or whatever, but again, this is one way of doing it, and it's a way that's, uh, that seems to work. Okay, 512 bytes is not that much, even though uh, you do that. And most files are not one or two bytes generally, but that's, uh, that's it. Even if it was a zero byte file, by the way, it would have one block associated with it and zero bytes for that. Okay, uh, when it's not 512, if it's more than 512, well, it takes more blocks in 512 byte chunks. Okay, the last one, if the file size is not a multiple of 512, is just a partial block. So if you have a, a file that's 513 bytes, you have two blocks, right? And 768, you have more, and so forth. Or 512, 1025 would be one more. Yeah. What's the benefit of storing it as blocks of 512? What was the last part? Uh, it's, well, it's, that's a good question. Is it just to make the calculations better? It's the, the way they've set up the drives, and it, it's a little historical in that drives were set up that it wants to be able to read that much and write that much. That's really what it is. Why is it 512? It's a multiple of two. I mean, that's the big reason why it's 512. But the, uh, the, the, the ability for it to do just those chunks, we had to find the quantum, if you will, somewhere. So they said, let's make it 512. If we had made it one byte, drives would be way too slow. If we made it four megabytes, well, it'd still be too slow because there'd be other issues going on. Yeah, good question. Any other questions before we get, keep going on this? What we're going to do basically, I'm going to go through this stuff, and then we're going to do three big examples that, uh, well, they're not that big, but three examples of doing this that, are, that I think you'll, uh, you'll see how this works if you are a little bit uh, confused about it. Okay, um, so this diagram down here, again, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but let me bump this up here. There are actually, there are actually, um, there are actually uh, two files on here that we'll see, a 32-byte file and a 1,028-byte file, okay? And here's how this works, and it's kind of color-coded for you here. Okay, there's the file that is in green. Again, I apologize to people who can't differentiate the colors. But the file in green here, okay, is a file that has uh, three blocks associated, 1,025, 1,027, 1,028. And each one of those blocks is 512 bytes. And the file itself happens to only have uh, 1,028 1, bytes associated with it. So it uses a full block here and then a full block here, and then a tiny little part of the next block. That's the way that goes. Okay. And the other file was just a 32-byte uh, file, which is here, which is going, well, it's actually, as it turns out, it's over, over here. But the, the information about it is here. And it uses um, this block here, 32 bytes worth. That's that. Okay. Question. Right. That's good. Good question. Would it be possible for files to share a block? Not with this operating system. Okay. So if you have ten files and they're all one byte, you need ten different 512 byte blocks. Some other file system may have that, but this one does not. Good question. Other questions. Okay. So let's move on. Um, we need to track which blocks are used to store those payloads, right? The whole point of this is if we've got a file spread out among the, the, the disk here, well, we better be able to find it, right? And you might think, oh, maybe we'll have some sort of linked lists where it goes one and then finds the other. That's one way to do it. It's not the way this does it, but that is one way to do it. Um, the way this does it is it has uh, the blocks that are used for the file listed in a particular place on the drive in that metadata area, okay, down here, okay, and they will, it lists them in what we call an inode, okay, and an inode is a 32-bit data structure for this operating system, it might be different for others, but for this operating system it's 32, uh, 32 bytes, I'm sorry if I said bits, it's 32 bytes data structure, and it stores the information about a single file, okay, you get things like the file size, you get the permissions, you get when it was created or modified, right? And you get the blocks that are all there. And the important ones for, that we care about are the file type, 
That could be either a directory or a file or a link, as it turns out. Uh, and also the file size, which is going to be critical. And in fact, the file size is the part that people get most confused about when they look at this operating, when they look at this file system. Okay? And what it is is this block or this inode, okay, lists all that information and it has space for up to eight different block numbers. The block numbers are the ones that show which block, tell which blocks in order the file is located in. Okay? So if you've ever had your hard drive crash, by the way, and there's various ways of hard drives crashing, but sometimes it can crash. And if it wipes out the metadata here, you will almost never be able to get your files back because they're spread all around the disk and they're just data. And so there's no way to reconcile where they are. So the um, various drive manufacturers do fancy things like they keep backups of this area somewhere else on the drive and they, they do things that try to make it so that if your hard drive does crash, you can get the data back. But in this case, if the metadata is gone, your file is just out there, 512 bytes at a time, just out there. So there's no real way to, uh, to, to get that back easily. Yeah. Ah, that's such a good question. What if your file is more than eight blocks long? We will get there. But, we'll, but that's a, a very good follow-on question. Okay, but we'll get there and they thought of that, of course. Because that's a good question. Because if 512, 512 times eight is like 4,096. And even in 1978, files were bigger than four kilobytes. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good question, right? So um, that's, uh, we'll have to deal with that. But keep that in, the, in your mind for another few minutes. Okay? Regardless, the um, inodes themselves, well, they go into blocks. Okay? Because they're, that's part of the thing. And what it is, is you can fit 16 inodes. This diagram's a little bit off. This actually only had, this, this diagram shows that there's only four inodes uh, per block. Don't worry about the numbers specifically down there. Just know that for this file system, you can store 16 32-byte inodes in one sector or one block. Okay, that's going to be critical when you do your, your assignment. Okay, and each one of those refers to a particular file or a particular directory on the disk. And when I say directory, a directory is a file. It's just a special type of file. You'll see what, you'll see what that means uh, when we do the examples. Okay. All right, so uh, let's look a little bit more at what this inode actually does. So the inode 2 here, okay, which would be down, uh, down here in green. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this a little bigger so you can see it. Um, but the one in green here is inode number 2. This is considered inode number 1. Even though it's the 0th one in the block, it's considered 1. I don't know why they, named, they numbered them starting at 1. You'll probably have to do a little off by one kind of arithmetic uh, when you do your assignment. But anyway, the point is we're going to look at inode 2, which happens to be right there. It's in block 2 or sector 2 offset 1, uh, offset one I guess, which is block 2. That makes sense? That's where it is. For now, you don't need to know more details than that. Okay? And what it says in it, in this case, is it says... And I guess it's offset 16 if you talk, uh, if you uh, are talking about, let's see. Uh, I know, oh, sorry, off, that's offset 16 for the four, but don't worry about that. For now, it's going to be offset of 32 bytes in that case. Um, the, in this case, it tells us that it's a regular file. It says how big it is, critical. And then it says how many blocks it's going to take. So if you know the file size, then you can start to figure out how many blocks it needs to take. And that is going to be very important to finding out how you can traverse these, uh, these inodes. Okay? Um, the blocks that are listed are 1027, 1028, and 1025 in that order. So if you look at it here, the, f the first part of the file is here beginning of the file. The second part of the next 512, oops, that wrong. The next, the first 512 bytes are here. The second 5,000, uh, I got that wrong again. It says 1,027 first. That's the first one, thank you. And then it says 1,028 is the next 512 bytes, and here's the final 512 bytes. Now look, the operating system is going to try to put these things in order. If it's got a whole bunch of uh, or the disk is going to, depending on which, but the, I guess it's the operating system, at least initially, is going to try to put it in order. 
Why? Because that just makes the most sense. But if it can't, it will find, it's got a list of free blocks and it just picks the next one that it can do. And this is where fragmentation comes into play and you have to be a little bit concerned about that sometimes. If you've been using your disk for a long time, sometimes you'll think your computer's slowing down. Um, and may, may be because your disk needs to be defragmented, meaning, hey, take all these, these parts of the files that are so far apart and put them closer together. Why would that matter except that they're right next to each other? The disk sometimes will read more than 512 bytes because it can and it buffers that and, and so forth. So, so that's the, the big idea there. All right, questions on how that works? And we'll get to the question there. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The offset should be each one of these. For, again, I, I, Ryan uh, came up with this, and he had a different reason for doing it this way. The, these should be you should get 16 inodes per block. Okay, so they're 32 bytes each, 16 of them. So that's that's all. Uh, when you do your assignment, you'll you'll get that. What I think I, I'll do is I'll update this diagram and make it so the slides are actually correct for what we're talking about here. Okay. All right. And by the way, because it is 1,028, as I already mentioned, the first two blocks, 1,027 and 1,028, completely filled. This one only a little bit partially filled. And by the way, how could this happen? Well, maybe uh, this file was bigger at one point, or there was another file here that freed up some space, and then this one got changed. I mean, you're always saving, right? Whenever you save, if it's bigger or smaller, the disk will uh, accommodate that in whatever way it can by deleting the uh, by freeing an ina or freeing a block or taking a new block, and so it's just going to happen as as it goes along. Okay, all right. So, as I said, they're not in contiguous or sorted order. You really have no idea until you actually read off the the numbers there about what it is. Okay, um, and this is what I kind of just said about how it's uh, uh, it could be for one reason or the other. Um, you might, uh, and we've already talked about this too, where you might get a file system that does reuse some blocks for, or multi, uh, kind of double up on blocks. This one does not. Okay. All right. The files inodes tell us where the, to find the payload, but as I said, it's also stored on the disk itself. Okay. That's the, the part that is the um, 32 bytes per I number. Okay, and you have to be able, you have to know that, right? Because you're going to be reading 512 byte chunks off the disk. And so if you want to find inode 3, you can do the math, the calculation, and say, oh, inode 3 must be in the first block because there's 16 in there. Inode 16 is also, I guess inode 16 will also be in the end of the first block. Inode 17 is going to be in the first node, first part of the next block. Okay, so you have to do those calculations, and when you get to your assignment next week, you will start to think about those. Okay, um, and as I said, you can store 16 of these side by side in a block. Right, and last time I think last time I'm going to mention it. If you think this is the only way to do it, it's not. If you do have to know how to do this for your assignment, that's correct. Yeah. Good question. If you uh, have a block that has partial, and the question was, if you, what if you had a block that had partial, was partially filled, and then you added more data and still didn't fill it? It would just fill right up to the. It's going to fill. It, edit the block. it will edit the block. It will. What it will do is it will read in the block, do the make the change, and then write the whole thing back again. That's what it'll, it'll actually do. Okay, and the operating system will take care of a lot of that for you. Good question. Okay, so. As humans, we like to remember, we don't like numbers so much, okay? And this is not a comment on like math education in the United States or anything. This is just saying that we don't like to remember, we're not as good at remembering numbers as we are words because that's you know, the way we are. Uh, words are, are easier to remember. It would not be so good if um, you had, a, if I said, uh, hey, I just put a spreadsheet in the Dropbox at 7088881 slash da 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 da, right? And that's how you had to refer to it, right? You'd go a little crazy trying to remember those things, okay? This is an emoji I found today. It's called like screaming face 
emoji or something like that. I also I, I also found another emoji. Do you know there's a, you know there's a thumbs up and there's thumbs down and all those. There's actually a middle finger emoji. I didn't know that until I don't think it's listed. Like you can't like pull it up on your phone and there it is. Like you got to kind of figure know how to do. It, I think. But anyway, um, I didn't put that one on here. But um, <laughs> you probably could if you if you got a file name that was like this. Some you could probably want that emoji. Um, but anyway, we don't like that. So what do we do instead? Of course, we use names, right? And we actually have paths. And in Linux and Unix, the paths are an English-like name, or, or I should say, a, a, a you know. A, a string which is separated by slashes, and you've been doing this, right? So you've got a path that's slash user, slash class, slash CS110, slash www, slash index.html, and that is going to be what we could remember. I mean, I can actually remember that when I can't remember all those different numbers, okay? So we need some sort of translation layer, okay? We need some sort of virtualization, if you will, between going from the numbers, which the computer likes, to the words within paths which we like, okay? And so that's handled with these special types of files called directories, right? And that's what we're gonna to have to do. And the directories are just files, meaning that a directory has an I number associated with it. You follow blocks in that I number to an actual file that has the, well, not there, I guess it would be here, that has a file in it. In fact, I'll zoom in on that uh, over here. It has information in it about the, uh, about the files that are in that directory, okay? And it says the name of the file, which by the way is limited to 14 characters, and here's a little tip for your assignment next week. It's limited to 14 characters and there is no trailing zero at the end, okay? If it doesn't, if it uses up all 14 characters. That makes sense? Like there's no, if it uses all 14, they don't bother with the new, with the zero because they know, you know that it's a maximum of 14. It's the way it goes, the way they described it. Remember, back when these things were created, memory was still kind of important. So we ended up with things like this and things like the Y2K problem. You guys, some of you guys were actually born, af anybody born after in 2000 or after? Yeah, youngsters. Um, the Y2K problem, for what it's worth, is, and it, I don't know if you've even heard of this, but this is the big thing back then was in 1997 or so, somebody realized that people only used, that most programs only used two digits for the date. And so they would use the last two digits, like 1993 or 1994 or whatever. They would just use 94. Well, what happens when you get up to 2000? It rolls over to zero, and then all of a sudden you don't know, you think you're in 1900 instead of 2000, and then people literally thought the world was gonna die, like gonna like explode or whatever at that point. And it didn't, of course, but um, most programs th those days, and in fact many programs these days were written in COBOL, which is a language from like the 1950s. And if you were a po COBOL program in 1999, you could in 2000 buy a vacation home because lots of people were hiring you to go fix the code that's been 30 years old or whatever, so anyway. All right, so anyway, so the, as, far as, op, as far as files are go, a directory is a file, oh, I didn't show you what else is in there. A directory is a file that has the name and an I number associated with it, okay? It has the I number in the directory. So if you're looking up a file name, you know what I number to go to, okay? By this, little, by this little file. And it is a real file. The operating system actually keeps the details of that file from you. You can't go and say, oh, let me, get the actual data out of that file to, uh, to, say whether, to see what the files in there are specifically. It's all hidden from you. You don't get access to that, okay? All right, um, how do we do this? Well, like uh, you actually probably could put a file name inside an inode, um, but the problem is uh, file names are kind of long. In fact, if you have the whole path associated with a file name, it can get very, 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 very long. And we want to keep the inodes th themselves small. We want to keep them 32 bytes. And in fact, if you tried to keep this entire path here in one inode, you'd run out of space. It's more than 32 bytes immediately. So we don't keep the names there. This is why we keep them in the actual, uh, the actual file associated with the directory itself, okay? Um, you also don't want to linear, like try to search through the actual uh, like linear, linearly search through the inodes. There might be a lot of inodes. There might be millions of them, right? So uh, you don't want to uh, have to try to do that every time you're looking for a file. Okay, that would be that would be kind of slow. Okay, there are better ways to do it. Question. Do file inodes only 
do file I numbers always start at two? Okay, that's a good question, um, and we'll get there in a little bit. The file I, the the only one, the first I node that you care about is the one right here that's at sector two offset zero, and that happens to be the root I node I number two right there. So or I should say. Yeah, it's actually in this file system, it's one. On newer ones, it is two. But it's like that's the one that's the directory for root. So now we're going to know where to start. And we'll see how that manifests itself in a minute. Question? Um, how does this file system know blocks that aren't used? Uh, good question. Some of the super block, I believe, keeps track of what inodes have been used or not. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how, like the mechanics of that part of it, but it does, the, the operating system is keeping, and the, the disk itself is saying, hey, these ones are failed and these ones aren't. Yeah. Other questions on this so far? Okay, we're getting there, yeah. So is the directory that maps the ID number to the file name in any way related to like directories you have on your like, computer that's like sort of files? Good question. Are the directories that, uh, the, the, direct, the file names in here per directory, are they related to the directories uh, on your computer? They are exactly the directories on your computer. That's what they are, in fact. So you've got, sla you've got a file for the root. You've got, a file for, uh, you've got a file for user. You've got a file for class. You've got a file for CS110, et cetera. And literally on the, in each one of those has its own inode associated with it. Good question. Yep. For the inodes themselves, is it something that tells you if it's in use or not in use? Yes, same thing. I mean, I think it's the operating system, or the, sorry, the disk itself has a list of which inodes are not used, and just like the blocks that are not used. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? All right, let's move on a little bit. So uh, what do we do for this? OK, we have a directory file type. I've already kind of mentioned this a little bit. Um, we don't really need to change our model to do this because we are going to simply say a directory is a special kind of file, but it really is just a file. So we don't need to make any changes. Um, we just lay this abstraction onto the system we've already got, and uh, we just say, great, now you're going to have to search through a bunch of files to find your directory, but it's going to be relatively fast because you, can, you only have to search through a, a limited number to actually find that. Okay, so it's not too bad. Um, you, the file payload, uh, the, uh, this is again, I think this is actually supposed to be, uh, hang on, that one. Uh, the file payload of series 16 bytes delivers a foreign table mapping names to I numbers. Oh yeah, sorry, that, that was right. This is the, uh, what we just talked about down here. We just talked about down here with the uh, thing. Each one of these is 16 bytes long. Okay, you have 14 bytes for the file name and then two bytes for the uh, number, the I number. That's what the 16 byte slivers are. When you talk about the file name of like A.mp3, that yep. one would actually be whatever that directory is slash A? Yes, that's a, good, that's a very good question. The question was, hey, wait a minute, where, where, what directory is this one stored in? It's wherever the directory that mp3 a.mp3 lives that's the file associated with this uh, with this file here yes good good question okay all right so when, and when we do the examples it'll start to become a little more a little more clear okay um, again the os hides this from you it's not like you can go and look at these files yourself even though they are just files the operating system won't let you it goes oh, i'm not going to let you look inside that directory file that's for me to use that's the way it goes Okay. All right. Uh, let's look at block 1024 on here. Okay, that's this one over. Uh, that's this one. We already we already did look at this one, as it turns out. Um, the directory contains two files. Okay. Uh, the total file size there uh, is actually 32. Why? Because each one of these slivers takes 16 bytes. Okay. And it uh, the First row of the table is the first file, second row is the second file, and you can look through these. And in fact, when you do your assignment starting next week on this stuff, you will have a struct that you will lay over this information so that you can walk through those files one after the other after the other. Okay, so it's just a bunch of, it's 32 bytes of data, and it's 16 byte chunks for each file. Okay, and again, you might ask, wait, what if uh, there were more than 16 times 500, or 512 divided by 16 number of files in the directory. Yeah, it's going to need multiple blocks to store that file, but it's just like any other file. 
you hopefully have some abstraction where you can say, give me an entire file or one, one uh, chunk at a time. And that's exactly what the uh, program you'll write does, and you'll have to abstract that away next week. Okay? All right, so, uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to search through these files. If you are looking for a directory or a file that is somewhere down the path, you are going, this file will hold, instead of saying a.mp3, you might be looking in the slash directory, and you might be looking for the user directory. Well, that's going to be user, and it's going to have an i number, and you're going to go to there and keep doing the process, either recursively or iteratively, depending on how you decide to do it. Okay. Like I said, we're going to do examples where you're going to see this in action. Okay. All right. Uh, what does the file look up actually like? How does it actually work? Well, if you were looking for uh, user slash user slash class slash CS110 slash example. Okay. First, we find the inode for the slash. Now, I've already mentioned that you know where that one is. It happens to be the first inode or inode number i number one inode number one um, that you go look at so that's where you start so you don't need to go like figure something else out you say okay i know where it's listed on the draw or what sector it is on the drive the i number and you go there okay so you search that payload in other words you go to the file associated with that and you search for uh the user token and then you find the i number associated with that and then you go to the inode table, you find that, you find out where the file is for that, you go to that file, you read the contents, in there you will hopefully find a uh, slash class, or a class file, and then you go to the class inode, or, and then you find the i number with that, you go to there, you find the file associated with that, you go read the file, and then you find uh, the CS110 file inside that. Okay, and then inside that, same thing, it's the same process again, look at the i number, go to the block associated with that, and then go and find the i number associated with the file, go to that i number, find all the blocks associated with that file, and read the file. That's how the process works. Okay? It's relatively fast. Okay? You have to look through at most uh, one, two, three, four different files to get to that. Um, and most paths aren't that many different, that many levels down. Okay? Question, how's it? Good question. The question was, hey, is this like a binary search or something? It is not. You do have to do a linear search through the files. Now, it may be that the files are in uh, alphabetical order, but I do not think they are at all. Like, you cannot guarantee that anyway. Um, what happens is when you create a new file, it just gets tagged down to the end of the, it's just on the end. They don't resort it or anything like that. So, good question, um, but you do have to do that. But again, directories really don't have that many files in them, and it's pretty quick to search through. Uh, 32 bit or 16 byte files. It's not our 16 byte in entries into the file. Relatively fast. Question. In that directory window, there's some um, binary like two and a three. Good question. Are these relative offsets or are they um, their uh, actually explicit ones? They are the i number associated with that. So it's not an offset or anything. It's just go to block two. Go to i number two starting at sector two in the file system. So in other words, starting here, start counting down here until you get to that number. That's how it works. It's not an offset. Okay, but it's, also, but it's still within that sector, right? It's not necessarily in that sector either. It's in the inodes. It's somewhere in, the, it's an I number, and so it's in the I nodes somewhere, and you just have to figure out, you do a little math. Uh, trust me, for the next assignment, you're gonna do some like arithmetic. <laughs> That's really it, yeah. Correct. Um, so wouldn't that limit the number of bytes? Yeah, two bytes is, uh, what, 16,000 16, uh, different I nodes? For this operating system, that was all you could add, or whatever. You probably couldn't add more than 16,000 files. But when the hard drive was five megabytes, it didn't really matter that much. You know? Question. Uh, good question. What happens if their two file names had 14 characters, the first 14 characters are the same, but they're different file names? They aren't different file names. <laughs> there is no way to make a file name longer than 14 bytes on this in this operating system. 
You were limited to that. In fact, DOS was that way. When uh, Microsoft DOS was that way for years, it was an eight plus three. In other words, eight characters meant three character extension. And then they had to do some. They had to jump through some big hoops to make it so that they could um, put uh, long file names into Windows when they did it that way. Yeah, it uh, it was a limitation. Nobody really thought it may have mattered <laughs> that they, they could do that. So, yeah, limitations back then that were kind of important. Good questions. Anybody else? Oh, over here. Sorry, Mr. Yeah. So final, final limitation, are you limited to 32 files per, per directory also? You, uh, good question. Are you limited to 32 files per directory? No, you can have as many as you want. And it wouldn't be 32. It'd be, yeah, I guess it would be, well, 512 divided by 16. Is that 32? Yeah, 32. But you'd just have more blocks associated with it, just like any other file. So your directory can have multiple files. Your directory can have multiple files. So yes, your directory is a file, which can be one block or multiple blocks. Up to eight, and we haven't quite gotten to this answer of like, whoa, what happens when there's more than eight? We will get there. Yeah? Is it guaranteed that each of those blocks is full? Nope, the blocks do not have to be full. Good question. Um, are, so, so hidden files don't show up in the directory files? Or? Yeah, yeah, this is a little bit, they do show up. The good, good question was, do hidden files show up? They do. I didn't represent it here. Yeah. So yeah, dot and dot dot do show up, if, you're, if that's your question. Anybody else? OK. So let's move on. We got some big stuff still happening here. OK. This was the question that came up earlier. All right. The question was, uh, inodes can only store eight block numbers. OK. They're just limited to that. All right. Why? Because that's the way they built it. OK. So that means, ostensibly, that you're limited to 8 by 512 or 4096 bytes worth of data for a file. Well. Even back then, as I said, that was far smaller than files you might want to uh, create. Okay, so what did they do? Well, they had to figure out some other method to do that. And what they did was they uh, said we had. They said, let's do what we call indirect addressing. Okay, so if you had uh, blocks like 2001 to 2008. Right, um, you would be full, right? Because you have eight of those times you have four thousand ninety-six bytes worth, and then you, the file would be full. Okay, once it gets bigger than that, a flag is set. It says, "Uh oh, now we have what we call a large file." Okay, and the large file switches everything, so that instead of listing the eight blocks for that list the data it lists blocks that themselves list blocks for data. Okay, So what that basically means is if you have a block, before it had eight numbers in it, and each one of those you'd go to the first one and that'd be your data and the second one would be your data and so forth. Now it's going to have eight numbers in it. In fact, it is seven. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, and what it, would, what it means is each one of those points to a block, and inside here the block itself is filled with numbers that are other blocks that are your data. Okay, it's an indirect inception kind of thing where you've got ind you're indirectly referring to your file by saying, okay, great, let's have each one of these numbers go to a block, and that block has a whole bunch of numbers in them to do that. Now, these are two byte numbers, blocks are 512 bytes each, meaning that you can have 256 different blocks per indirect block. Okay, why? Because you've got one indirect block pointing to here, or a block, a inode block number pointing to this block. Inside here you have 256 more numbers. Each one of those numbers points to a block of actual data in that order. Okay, that's called indirect addressing. And you can do that for every block of the original eight blocks except it's only seven and we'll get to why in a minute. Okay, but what does that mean? That means if you did store all eight blocks as indirect blocks, okay, well how much data can we store now? We could store eight of those blocks, block numbers, because we have eight of them in the inode. Each one has 256 other block numbers. Each one of those can store 512 bytes. Eight times 256 times 512 is one megabyte. That's how big your file could be with indirect addressing. Okay? 
What questions do you have about that so far? That takes a few minutes to process. First time I saw it, I went, oh, what's going on there? Yeah. Ah, that is a good question. The question was, is the number of levels of indirection limited? Uh, for now, all we consider is there's one level of indirection. We'll get to that in a second. You're, you're thinking one slide ahead or two slides ahead. But yes, there, for now, just think there is no other, for this, this case, one level of indirection. That's all we need to worry about. We'll get to the other one in a second. Uh, somebody else? Yes? What's that? You changed your mind. Okay. Anybody else have questions about this? Yeah? If you're using indirection addressing, does that mm -hmm. mean that Good question. Do, did we say, do, do we have all the blocks using indirect addressing or just some of them? You automatically switch to a full indirection, right? And it means the operating system and the drive have to do the, the moving of your files. I mean, the minute it gets a bit bigger than 4096, kind of, oh, wait a minute, we've got to switch things here. And then um, you end up going with that. And, it, uh, and then if you go back to 4095, it'll switch back again and, and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's pretty dumb in that sense, but it does that. Other questions about that? OK. So you might be saying to yourself, great. In 1977 or 1978, a million byte file was pretty big, and they just left it at that. Well, even in 1978, a million byte file, one megabyte, although it was a, a big proportion of the available hard drives in general, was not big enough to store all the data that you might want to. OK, so they said, well, now what do we do? <laughs> right? And you kind of almost hit on what we, what we do. But um, what we do is we say, all righty then. If you have a indirect addressing, why not go to doubly indirect addressing? OK? And it's not as bad as you think. OK? You might think, well, now we just go and once it gets bigger again, we, get, we just do everything over again like we did before. It's not quite that bad. OK? Um, that would probably lead to, when you hit that threshold, you'd all of a sudden have to change things a lot, and, you don't, and it would be more movement than they wanted to do. But what they did was they said, OK, if you use more than seven of your indirect blocks, the eighth indirect block is a doubly indirect block. And what that means is, and this is really inception, right? You have the, the seven block numbers that are going to indirect blocks. Each one of those goes to one that has 256 entries in it. The final block number, the eighth block number, points to a block, okay, which is filled with block numbers, 256 of them, each one of which goes to a block which has 256 numbers in it, which each one points to a data file or data part of, part of your data, okay? It's an indirect scheme because you can do that, right? And they just they explicitly say just that eighth block and only that eighth block, if you need to use it, should be interpreted as a doubly indirect block. Okay? So there's a couple. I'll have a, a the summer, summary down here goes through the, the details here. And again, you'll have to figure these details out for assignment next week. And it sounds like oh, this is crazy, but it's not as bad as you think once you understand what's happening. Is the eighth, let me explain the eighth block again, okay? Here, let me do it, let me do it this way. Okay, you have a, uh, you have the inode here, okay? And the inode has seven numbers in it, okay? We'll call them uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And those are all singly indirect, okay? They each point to one, they each point to a block which has 256 data block pointers, basically, or beta block inodes, okay? And each one of those goes to a data block, okay? That last one here, okay, the eighth one is a special one, and it is in, uh, it's a regular number, just like the others, that points to a block, and when you go to that block, you will find 256 numbers. Each one of those numbers points to a block which has 256 numbers in it, which each point to data. Does that make sense? As far as does that answer your question? As far as what's happening there, there's no other like there's no other abnormalities to it, and it's always the seven, the eighth one, and it's always the one that 
is used if it's necessary. That's something in the back there. No? Yes? Uh, do the uh, indirect blocks, are those any strings or are those just all numbers? They are all two byte numbers. Okay. Yep, and that's it. And they're just two byte inode numbers. That's all they are. Okay. All right. Question? So if you only want to use single indirect, what do you think is the most sensitive? If you want to use, yes. If, Yes, if your file is small enough so that it only fills in the first seven uh, indirect block numbers, that's all you would do. The minute you go over to that eighth one, now it's a doubly indirect and you have to deal with it that way. But, but, it's, but it's not, there's no, there's no decision making at that point. The only real decision is, have I gotten, have I gotten bigger than 4096? And then it goes to the indirect method. And in the indirect method, there's one of those blocks that's doubly if it's needed. It's always the last one. That's that. All right, so um, let's, uh, yeah, go ahead. So are the indirect blocks still considered files, or are they like these special blocks? Are the indirect blocks still considered files? Uh, the indirect blocks are, no, they're just blocks in that case. They're not files themselves. They don't have associated uh, I numbers with them. No, they, they well, they, they have block numbers. They do not have I, I numbers with them. They're not files. Good question. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, let's summarize. The, and by the way, here's the final calculation, by the way. Okay, um, you can have up to uh, 7 plus 256 indirect blocks. Why? Because you have 7 from the 7 that you've got that are indirect, right? Plus you have 256 more indirect blocks because of the block that is now a doubly indirect block. For a total of 263 indirect blocks, each one of which points to, uh, has 256 blocks associated with it, okay? And uh, each one of those 256 blocks associated, each one is 512 bytes, meaning that you can have a total of now 34 megabytes for a file in the Unix version 6 file system, okay? 34 megabytes today is zero, <laughs> right? So, you know, an MP3 is bigger than 30, 34 megabytes or what have, you know, most things are bigger than 34 megabytes these days. Um, but back then that was a big deal. Um, I'm gonna date myself, but my first computer didn't even have a hard drive for what it's worth. But the, um, when I did get a hard drive for it, it was 20 megabytes and I went, well, I will never fill that up. And, uh, and it took like, and it took hours to like back it up and so forth, the floppy disks and whatever. But it, um, but back then, 34 megabytes was still, was pretty big back then, right, for the number of things that you wanted to do. And if you did need bigger files, well, you'd do just like we do today. You would have to break them into different files and somehow keep that separate from the file system. And go, look, I just know that I'm gonna have to do this myself for files that are bigger than that. You would chunk them up yourselves. But anyway, point is, now we've got an app up to 34 megabytes, okay? All right, so to summarize, okay, if a file is less than 4,096 bytes, okay, we take those, that I number, and it, you, you go to the I node associated with that I number, and it's got eight block numbers in there, and it also says the file size, by the way, so you know how to interpret this, but you go and you find the, the, eight, the eight block numbers are all used as a direct addressed block. So all eight of those, have 512 byte, uh, bytes associated with the block, that you go there, you find the data in that order. And it doesn't have to use all eight, you can use one or two, up to eight. The instant you go above 4096, you are now a large file. And for large files, the first seven block numbers are indirectly addressed, meaning that each one has 256, it's each one goes to a block which has 256 numbers in it, each one of those goes to data, and you do it in order. If you need to use the eighth block, that eighth block is now doubly indirectly addressed, meaning that it refers to a block which has 256 block numbers, which are which each refer to a block which has 256 block number, or each one refers to yeah, if you have 256, which refers to 512 different ones. Okay, that's how it works. Question. The two byte number is a block number, not an I number, correct. That's a good question. Okay. All right, and again, this goes to the question of are, are they files or not? They're not. Once they're blocks that are associated with this scheme, they are not no longer considered files. Okay, so 
let yeah question sorry uh, yeah Correct. Good question. Where do you store those flags that show indirect addressing? The I num number itself, remember it has six, it has eight numbers associated with the bytes. It's 32 bytes long. There's 16 bytes worth that are just there for data, metadata. And it has the file type, it has the size, it has the uh, flags that are set, whether it's large or not. Good question. And you will see when, when you do this, when you do the assignment associated with this, we've showed you structs that you can use that can map right over that data. Anybody else? Okay, let's do a couple of examples. All right, we'll do three examples here. We are going to try to locate a file called local slash, fi slash local slash files slash fairytale.txt, and then we want to read that file. Okay, that's the first thing we're going to do. Then we're going to look at reading a file called slash med file or med file, which is a medium sized large file. Okay, it's bigger than 4096, but not as big as. Uh, 917,504, which would be using all seven of those indirect blocks. Okay, and then we will go and read a file called big slash big file, which is a large file which is bigger than 917,504 bytes, but smaller than 34 megabytes. Okay, and by the way, at that limit right there, you do have other overhead because now you've got at least two more blocks that have to be used for your metadata and whatever, but it, it's not, not, the, not the biggest deal in the world when your files are that big anyway. It's a tiny, tiny amount of extra data that you're using. Okay? All right, so hopefully I came up with this diagram that actually will make sense. Okay? Uh, hopefully it's big enough too. So we are going to look for slash local slash file slash fairytale.txt. Here's the steps on how you do that. Okay? You first look for the slash directory. Okay? We know where that lives. There's no calculations necessary. It lives at I number one. Okay? And I number one happens to be, I, I did not put sector zero and sector one here. This is sector two, sector three, sector four. I node one lives at sector two offset zero. That is where the file, that is where the inode lives that tells you where to go look for your root directory. Okay, no, no calculations necessary in that sense, or no thinking, no like decision making there. You go there, you look it up, and that's that. Okay, so what does this say? Well, what I've got on here is these are the block numbers in this column here. Okay, these are the file size. I just threw that in just so we can kind of check and see the size of the And then these are the I numbers associated with uh, the I node. And those are in order, of course, right? You get one, two, three, four, all the way up to however many you have. Remember that you only get um, 16 of them per block. Okay, this is the arithmetic part you have to deal with. Now we're doing it kind of abstractly. You will have to figure out the arithmetic a little bit later. Okay. All right, so anyway, you go to inode 1, that's the root. You say, okay, what block numbers are associated with that file? 25, okay? And it's only 80 bytes long, so I know I'm only going to have to do one block number, and it's singly addressed, or it's directly addressed, not indirectly addressed. So you go to block 25, which happens to be down here, and you look through the, and you know that it's a directory, because it's definitely a directory, because that's the whole point and of the root. And you look through and it's got some files in it. Now in this case I did put the dot and dot dot in there. Okay? And you look through and you read that file and you go, is that, uh, I'm looking for local by the way. That's the first thing I'm looking for. Is that local? No. Is that local? No. Is that local? Yep. Well, that means that it says, oh, local's I number is 16. So what do you do? You go up to uh, block, I node number 16 and that must be local. Okay, and so you do there and you go, oh, okay, what, what do I need to do? Well, it's 1,001 bytes long, and I look at block 27 first, and then I'll read 54 if I need to. And you go to block 27, which is down here, and you say, okay, let me read through this. Now I'm looking for uh, files, okay, because that's the next part of our path. And so in five, not files, not files, oh, there's files at I number 31. You see how this is like recursive or iterative or whatever? Just keep doing that all the way through the thing. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Keith Schwartz. <laughs> iterative, yes. Um, it's either whichever one you want, right? But I would do it iteratively. It's just easier that way, I think. But anyway, so you go down here and you say, okay, great. 
Files is at 31. Okay, so you go to 31, which is here, and you go, oh great, that means I go to block 32, which is over here, and now I'm looking for fairytale.txt. And I go down here and I say, okay, well, uh, 30, so I go to 32, and I look at, that's not fairytale, there it is, block 47. And now we found our file, right? And now we know it's a file. We can check and see if it's a file or a directory if we want to. But now we've gone there, and we go to 47, I number 47, which happens to be over here, and you go, oh great, it is a 1,057 byte long file. Right? And so you go, okay, great, let me start reading it. I'll go to block 80, and it, because it's 1,057, we know that it's less than our large file differentiator, right? So it's just gonna be direct blocks, that's nice. So you go to block 80, and you go to 80, and that's gonna say once upon a time there was a vast forest, because it's a fairy tale, right? And then you read the next one, and this may not be in order. In fact, it isn't in this case. You go to 89, and it says da da da, and the princess soldier starts start to Google, which blah blah, blah right? And then you go back, and that's the next part. And then you finally go to 87, and you get to 87, that, and, and they lived happily ever after. Now, until you get to 87, how much data are you going to read from each one of these? That's actually kind of a trick question. How much data are you going to always read from a sector? 512 bytes. How much is relevant for 80 and 89? All 512. How much is relevant for 87? Well, you have to do the, the calculation, right? You have to do a little either modding and dividing and, you know, that arithmetic stuff, right? Because you need to know you will read 512 bytes. In fact, the disk is not going to try to figure, the disk doesn't say, hey, you want to read 7 bytes? I'll give you 7 bytes. No, it says here's 512 bytes. You do with it what you want. It might be garbage. Some of it's garbage. And some of it is the end of your file. You do the math to figure that out, okay? So that's how that works, all right? And then we found it and then we're done, so that's that. Questions on that? Straightforward enough, I hope? I mean, given that this is new and we're able to do it? I think you could look through that and do it that way? Okay, good. All right, so then let's look at the next one here. Now we wanna read a file called slash med file or med file. Right, it's a medium-sized file. Well, how do you do it? First, we have to find it, by the way. Right, if you're gonna do that, we, I, I could have said, oh, look, we know it's at this inode number. Well, let's just actually find it. What do we do? We go to the root directory, we know where that lives, and we go there and we say, and it's the same one as before, because I just kind of copied and pasted this over there and changed a couple things. But anyway, you go to block 25, you go to 25, you start reading through the files. It's not that one, it's not that one, it's not that one. Oh, there it is. It's the file we're looking for. It is a file, you can go, go to the file and find out that it's actually a file. So you go to I number 16, which is here. And once you're here, you say, oh, okay, how big is this file? 800,000 bytes. Well, that's bigger than 4,096, so I'm gonna start using my indirect addressing, okay? So you go, great. There's one, two, three, four, five, six different I nodes associated with this. I hope I counted that right anyway. And what you do is you go to the first one, you say, okay, let's go to block 26. Well, down at block 26, I know that these are not, this is not a file. These are more block numbers, two bytes each. I go to the first one and I go, okay, 80. Well, that's where my file starts, okay? So I go over to file start and says it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right there. And that's the first one. Well, then I go to the next one and that goes to 87 and 87 is over here. It was the spring of hope, it was winter of despair, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And you do the same thing all the way through this list. Right? And that's going to be 256 different blocks right? of 512 bytes. And then you go to the next one. right? And you do the same exact thing. And you go to 30 and you go, OK, great. I'm now going to go to uh, block 89. And I go over to 89 and the accident happened in getting out of the cart. And that is uh, the 257th data block okay? because it's indirectly addressed. Right? And you keep doing that all the way through in that particular order, going, the, going back here every time you get through the 256, going back down there, doing 256 of those, et cetera, until you get to the last one, which is the last one of block 59, and you need to count right, because it might not be all 256 used, right? It might just be, you know, however many you need. You need to kind of recognize that. For the last one, there's going to be some off by whatever errors, depending on whether it's 50, 512 block bytes or not. Good? Everybody with us on that one? Okay, hopefully that's not too bad. 
The last one, let's take a look. The last one is now we're going to try to read slash large file. We first have to find it and then read it. Okay, same thing. You first go to the root. You find that you have to go to block 25. You go to block 25, which is a file. You read the file. You know that these are each uh, 16 bytes each. You go down, you look, you're not in large file. There's the large file. It happens to be at I number 16. You go up to I number 16 and you go, holy smokes, this is an 18 megabyte long file. And you go, great. Now, it's not, you have to know that, but it's not quite, quite as critical to know that until you get to that last block there, or that last block number, right? Remember, all of the first seven ones are exactly indirect, like we just did in the previous one. Okay, so what do you do? You go to 26, and you go down to 26, and you read off 80, and you go to 80, and this was the beginning of the file, and then you go to 41, which I don't have on here, and that's the next one, and 82, et cetera. Okay, and then you're done with this one. And then you do the same thing for 35, and 32, and 50, and 58, and 59. And then you finally get to block 30. And block 30, you go to block 30, and you go to, oh, I got to go to 87. But I know that it's doubly indirect. So you go to 87, and 87 has more numbers in it. And the first number, you go to the file there. And that happens to be the 1,793rd data block because you're counting all this up, right? And then you do, for you go through each one of these, then you go back to uh, block 30 again, and you read 114, and 114 has 256 different numbers, right? And those go to, and, and, and th those each have 256 different numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Should we block 87 also? Should I what? So 87 should have, let's see, 87, did I do it wrong? I might have done it wrong, let's see. So 87 was from here, 87 should be, no, 87 goes to 89, and that's a block number, that's another number, which goes to, uh, let's see, which goes to the actual data. Yeah. Make sense? You go to 30, that has a block number, right? If it was indirect, that would point to data. But now it points to a block which has a block pointing to data. Yeah, shouldn't it have 256? It has 256 of them here. Okay. Oh. Right, yes. The two, and that's an all, I mean, it could have 256 there. It may not, okay. but it could have up to 256 there. Yeah. Doesn't it have to? Doesn't it have to? Doesn't it have to if there's uh, the Not necessarily. It's 114 would have to Oh, sorry, yes, you're right. If because of this, yes. That you could have that, you could have this be the last one, which goes to there, and then it's only <coughs> correct because of the way I've done it around here. All right, so questions, yes? Uh, real quick, on block 30, which is your first inter of the indirect blocks, Cor it's block 30, yep. If the file says it's 18 megabytes, it wouldn't have 256 of those, right? It would have like 130. Uh, you know, I don't know if I did the math right, but yeah, it would have however many are necessary to get up to the maximum file size in there. Yes, it does not have to have 256 here, right? The that would be if you had almost 34 megabytes worth. Yes, correct. Other questions on this? The kind of like, hopefully it makes sense. I mean, the first time you see it, you go, oh man, it's so complicated. And it is pretty complicated for what it's worth, but it's not un no unlearnable. I mean, you can certainly learn it and you just have to know how to do it. And my final comment, which was exactly my first comment was, don't worry about that this is the only way to do it. There are many hundreds of, probably thousands of different file systems. Another question, yes? I think you're saying you have Say again? I think you already have seven. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I should have done another one, sorry, thank you. That should be an eight, thank you. Keeping me honest, I'll fix that on the slides. Anyone else? All right, we'll see you on Monday. Don't forget to sign up for labs on Sunday.